Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Old South Meeting House. Uh, this afternoon, we are here to enjoy the second in a two-part December Middays at the Meeting House series titled Law and Disorder in Boston, 1773. Last week, we met two 18th century Bostonian gentlemen who sparred on issues of taxation, trade, and political representation. Today, we will learn about another 18th century Bostonian, Ebenezer McIntosh, in the context of gangs and riot in colonial Boston. And now I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Matthew Wilding, who will speak on the topic, Ebenezer McIntosh, the gangs of Boston, and riot in the new world. Matthew is the former content director of the Freedom Trail Foundation, where he oversaw training of tour guides. He currently works as the Senate Immersion Module Captain at the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate, um, in addition to Ebenezer McIntosh in 18th century Boston. Matt's historical research in interests include 20th century social and cultural history. He's currently working on his master's thesis in history at UMass Boston, a study of the federal government's effort to promote cultural pluralism through the war bond campaign in World War II. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Matthew Wilding. Thank you. Good, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming out and braving the cold. Uh, so I, uh, I was booked for this talk uh, a number of months ago uh, by Erica, uh, and thank you so much for having me, Erica. Uh, when we had this conversation about, this, about the talk I was going to give, uh, it seemed like we were going to have a conversation about the theoretical value of riots in the political world uh, in the 18th century and in American history. And as it turns out, uh, Erica can see the future. And now we know that this is a very relevant topic. Uh, talking about riots in America as a political expression is a really valuable conversation to have now. So when we talk about riots, what is it that we're talking about? Well, for our purposes, the way I'm going to define a riot uh, is a, uh, a protest that is violent, uh, that, is, uh, that, is, that is done by a group of people who perceive themselves to lack power in the current political structure. And the perception is a really important point here. They don't necessarily lack power but they feel like they do. Uh, and this is true right now in Ferguson, Missouri. It was true in 1886 in the Haymarket Affair in Chicago, and it was true in the 1760s in the streets of colonial Boston. So this is the framework we're going to be talking about riots in. Now, riots are important in the American Revolution because they they're, they're common. They happen a lot. Uh, the way we get to the ultimate revolutionary movement starts on the streets, and it starts with these rioters. Uh, and much has been said about one particular riot. And I think in the Old South Meeting House, we all know what that riot is. What, what is that riot? The Boston Tea Party. We talk about the Boston Tea Party all the time. And also, of course, the Boston Massacre, which could be characterized as a riot. Uh, but there are earlier riots uh, that lead up to the Boston Massacre and the Boston Tea Party. Uh, and I would characterize these riots as essentially training events uh, to the main event uh, of the Boston Tea Party. And the Boston Tea Party, of course, is our kind of crossing the Rubicon uh, into, a, into a point where we can't go back from uh, towards the American Revolution. But in the 1760s, there are a series of other riots. And we can characterize 1765 particularly as the year of the riot. There are, just, there are a lot of riots, and we'll talk about them. Uh, these riots in 1765 tend to revolve around a law called the Stamp Act. And the Stamp Act is a, is a tax, essentially. It's a tax on paper goods, legal documents, playing cards. It affects almost everybody in the colony. Uh, now, there had been other taxes that people had protested previous. Uh, of course, the Sugar Act comes to mind in 1764. Uh, but despite the fact that people were upset about the Sugar Act, uh, it didn't cause mass violence in the streets. That isn't to say, though, that in 1764, there was not mass violence in the streets. It just didn't happen to be about a tax. It was the culmination of an annual event that had been going on for at least a generation. And this first riot that we're going to start the talk with happens on November 5th of 1764. 
November 5th, 1764 marks uh, a, a day that is celebrated in Boston uh, that we refer to as Pope Day. Uh, now, Pope Day uh, is called in the rest of the British Empire to this very day, Guy Fawkes Day. Uh, now, Guy Fawkes Day is a celebration of the foiling of a bombing. Uh, in 1605, by Guy Fawkes and some of his Catholic compatriots, they tried to blow up Parliament. They were caught, they were arrested, they were executed, and a day of remembrance was actually put into the Anglican prayer books to remember the foiling of this so-called gunpowder plot. Uh, it's celebrated throughout the empire, predominantly with, fire, with bonfires uh, and uh, with uh, kids making effigies. Uh, penny, they'd say penny for the guy, and they build their Guy Fox effigy, and they beg for money. In Boston, though, the celebration evolved, and it evolved in a really special and unique way uh, into something of a sport, almost a riotous sport. And this evolution comes from these two gangs in Boston, and Boston has these very definitive gangs. Uh, they are the North End Gang and the South End Gang. Now, the South End Gang uh, seems to be the older gang, uh, the South End gang is comprised of uh, a lower sort of folks. South Enders tend to be poorer in the 18th century than North Enders. Uh, they tend to own less property. Less of them have the right to vote. Uh, they're farther away from their port. Uh, they're in a less populous part of town, less desir desirous, par uh, desirous part of town. Uh, and they build this gang, um, which seems to articulate a, a sort of hostility towards the North End, because the North End is a little better off. The North End, in response, forms its own gang, representing kind of a higher culture in Boston, even though most of the members of the, Nor of the North End gang are very similar to the South End gang. They're lower, they're lower, level, uh, lower economic standing people uh, than, the, uh, uh, than most of their neighbors in the North End. But they live in the North End, so they defend their North End. Now, these protests between these two communities uh, evolve into a kind of codified event every year on November 5th, where they build huge floats, these huge floats. And these floats have effigies on them of the Pope. And then, after they're done building the floats, they get themselves properly lubricated, uh, and then they bring the floats downtown, and in the middle, a middle point between the north, end and the, the north End and the South End. The North End starts in North Square, roughly where Paul Revere's house is. Uh, and the South End gang, they start at the Old Elm, which will eventually become the Liberty Tree. And they bring these floats downtown, and then it appears that they just beat the hell out of each other for a few hours. And whoever wins the fight claims the other group's effigy of the Pope. It's very festive. Uh, now, these, these kind of sporty riots went on for years. Uh, and the North End dominated them, particularly in the 1750s and 1760s. But in 1764, something changes really dramatically. And you wouldn't have known it the day before. You wouldn't have known on November 4th that something big had happened, but something big happened. And what happened was the South End appointed a new leader. And that new leader was named Ebenezer McIntosh. Now, who is Ebenezer McIntosh? McIntosh is a very, very poor guy. <laughs> He's from the South End. He doesn't appear to own any property in 1764. He would eventually own property outside of Boston. Uh, but he's about 28 years old. Uh, he has been essentially on his own since he was 14. His mother died uh, when he was very young, and his father was, quote, warned out of town. Uh, warned out of town means he was told to leave. Uh, so probably not the most savory character. So Macintosh, at the age of 14, uh, is left in Boston essentially by himself. He's apprenticed to a shoemaker, appears to have been his uncle. Uh, and working as an uh, apprentice as a shoemaker, he learns that trade. Now, the, the role of shoemaker is not a particularly prestigious role. You don't make a lot of money, you work long hours, you work very hard. Uh, so Macintosh has a rather unexceptional life. The only uh, civic engagement that he appears to have been involved in before 1764 is he briefly served uh, in, in the military. Uh, and he also was a member of the fire brigade in Boston. And he was actually recruited uh, by uh, the future sheriff, Sheriff Greenleaf, into that role. And he would end up having quite a few run-ins with Sher Sheriff Greenleaf later. But McIntosh is a rather unexceptional figure. But on November 5th, 1765, McIntosh gets his, his gang, the South End gang, more enthusiastic than they usually are about this riot. They build a big float, and they pull it just as hard, as, uh, as, hard and as fast as they can downtown. And they apparently lose control of that float. And when they lose control of the float, they run over a child, nine-year-old. And the kid is crushed to death. The boy is crushed to death. Now, 
amazingly, in a generation of having riots or events where these floats are dragged downtown and then everyone fights, it appears no one's ever died. <laughs> So it's a big deal that a child has died. Uh, and so the local officials, they cancel, they cancel the, the Pope's Day festivities. Uh, they go to the North End, they tell the North Enders that a child has died, they take their float away, the North End respects it, proper gentleman. Then they go back to the South End, they try and take the float that the South Enders built. But the South Enders, under the orders of Ebenezer McIntosh, protected the float. They defended their Pope. And because the North End had lost their float and lost their Pope, and the South End had, had protected their float, the South Enders claimed that they won the Pope Day riots. Uh, the end result of this, uh, immediately, is that Ebenezer McIntosh is arrested, presumably by Sheriff Greenleaf. Uh, but he doesn't stay in jail long. He only stays in jail for about a day. And then he apparently pays a fine, and then he, he's released. The long-term end result, though, is that Ebenezer McIntosh has established that the South End gang can win, can perform, and that he is their leader. And he couldn't have done this at a more important time uh, in colonial Boston. Because just a few months later, on April 8th of 1765, in the Boston Gazette, a Whig paper that will end up being associated with the Patriot cause quite a bit, the, uh, the, Stamp, the Stamp Act is published. Now, the Stamp Act had been rumored in months that had uh, come before, and people had talked about, talked about it in very general terms, but when we actually get the language of the Stamp Act, the severity of, uh, of the taxes, how, how all-encompassing they are, people increasingly get upset about them. But what makes people most upset, particularly the writers in the Boston Gazette, uh, is that the law seems to suggest that we need to be protected by the British Empire. And there may be truth to that. But they didn't like the implication. Uh, and so the newspapers started whipping up opposition to the Stamp Act. And lots of people read the newspapers. The Boston Gazette, particularly, is a very widely read newspaper. It also happens to be owned by Benjamin Eads, who is one of uh, an organization we tend to refer to as the Loyal Nine, a precursor to the, uh, the Sons of Liberty. So this, this future revolutionary leader uh, is publishing all of this venom uh, towards the Stamp Act and blaming the government for infringing on the rights of the people. Now, soon after the word of the, the law, uh, the language of the Stamp Act gets to Boston, we then find out who is going to enforce that law. And the man who is going to enforce the law of the Stamp Act is a man named Andrew Oliver. He's the stamp master, according to the newspapers. Andrew Oliver also, also happens to be the brother-in-law of Thomas Hutchinson, who at the time is Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts Bay Colony and the Chief Justice of, this, of the court here. Uh, and so there's a little bit of nepotism suspected. Uh, Oliver thus becomes the, ta the target of people's hostility towards uh, regarding the Stamp Act. Uh, people start writing pretty nasty things about him. They and uh, the, the newspapers, particularly under uh, the pen of James Otis, who's using a, uh, a pseudonym, the newspaper says something particularly terrible about him. Uh, I just want to pull it up, sorry. Got a little ahead of myself. It's, uh, the newspapers publish, and James Otis writes this, uh, when, the, uh, when the present shall die off or be suspected, there can be no uh, objection to the appointment of Europeans as I wish it had been at first. If we look carefully into the history of these provinces to the earliest times, we shall find that in every grievance, every hardship in the restriction of our trade or commerce, some high or low dirty American has had a hand in, proc in procuring it for us. The implication here is that the person who puts forth the most oppressive laws on behalf of the British government is not the British government itself. It is the American that is doing the work for the British government. So the newspapers are fanning these flames in the public that not only is the Stamp Act unjust and maybe even Ill illegal, but that the people who are enforcing it right here in this colony, they're the biggest problem. They're the people we should be mad at. Now, that quote that I just read uh, was published on August 12th of 1765. Previous to this, there uh, had been uh, re the release in public multiple publications of a series of resolves from the, from the colony of Virginia. Uh, they're called the Virginia Resolves. They're written by Patrick Henry. Uh, the Virginia Resolves also stoke a lot of anger and hostility towards the government and border on treason. Uh, and uh, Patrick Henry actually is reported to have said, if this be treason, 
let's make the most of it. Uh, and that quote by Patrick Henry, whether or not he actually said it, was circulated throughout the colonies, that speaking out against the British government and calling them, uh, calling them tyrants uh, for putting these taxes on the people, uh, if it's treason, so be it, it's treason. Let's, let's move forward with the treason. The newspapers also start suggesting that maybe violence uh, could solve this. Uh, the full vengeance on the heads of the British crown are promised uh, by the Boston Gazette. So August 12th. August 12th, this new, uh, newspaper report is, is published. On the very same day, Samuel Adams, who is a tax collector at the time, uh, he gets a warrant for the arrest of someone who hasn't paid his taxes. And that gentleman happens to be Ebenezer McIntosh. <laughs> So McIntosh has not paid his taxes, and Samuel Adams is responsible for arresting him for not paying his taxes. And Samuel Adams sends the warrant back, so he does not arrest Ebenezer, have Ebenezer McIntosh arrested. Now, around the same time, within this, this day or two period, uh, there are meetings in the Eads and Gill Publishing House, which publishes the Boston Gazette. Uh, Isaiah Thomas recounts them in his history of printing. And uh, it is suggested that Samuel Adams is at at least one of these meetings. Uh, and then the newspapers publish this, this account from James Otis, uh, and, uh, and Ebenezer McIntosh is let to walk free despite the fact that he's supposed to be arrested. Two days later, there is a convening of, a ga of the gang in, a, in the very early morning, and they meet at the Old Elm, which will forever be called the Liberty Tree afterwards. And at the Liberty Tree, they hang an effigy, and the effigy says Stamp Man on it. And the effigy is of Andrew Oliver. Uh, they also hang another effigy from the tree, and it's a boot with a green soul and a devil coming out of it. Now, this is, a, this is really kind of high-level symbolism that I don't know how anyone ever understood at the time. But the green soul is supposed to symbolize Lord Grenville, who is the, uh, the prime minister of the British Empire at the time. Uh, and the boot with the devil in it is supposed to symbolize the Earl of Boot, who is a parliamentarian uh, who the colonies are not big fans of. He's a big advocate of taxing us. Uh, but the stamp effigy is the primary effigy. Now, this effigy is hung, and it's defended by, by the gangs, presumably including uh, Ebenezer McIntosh. He'll definitely be there later, but presumably he's there now. It's protected. Uh, the, uh, the sheriff, Sheriff Greenleaf, is ordered to take it down by the governor of the colony, Governor Bernard. Uh, the, the crowd stops him from doing that. They refuse to let him pass. Uh, and so the effigy just hangs all day. And as the effigy hangs all day, more and more people gather towards the Liberty Tree. Estimates from Governor Bernard say that up to 5,000 people surrounded the Liberty, Liberty Tree and protected that effigy. 5,000. The population of Boston in 1765 is about 15,000. So 5,000 is it's a third of the population. That's huge. Uh, and at night, when things got a little bit more wild, uh, the, pop, uh, the, the crowd was still as large as 3,000 people. As dusk came, the crowd, led by Ebenezer McIntosh, took the effigy down, and they marched it towards the old state house. They stopped in front of the old state house and started shouting profanities at the old state house continuing to hold the effigy of Andrew Oliver. And then they brought the effigy of Andrew Oliver to Andrew Oliver's house. And in front of Andrew Oliver's house, they beheaded the effigy. They then went to a warehouse that was built by Andrew Oliver. And it was assumed that Andrew Oliver was going to use this building as the stamp master headquarters to distribute stamps uh, to, be put on, to be affixed to legal documents, newspapers, and, and such. They go to this building. It apparently was actually just going to be rented out to stores. Uh, but they thought it was going to be used for this nefarious purpose of distributing stamps. So they tore it down. Governor Bernard insists that they did it in five minutes. I find that hard to believe. But five minutes or so, they tear the whole building down. They then use the pieces of the building, and they make a big bonfire on Fort Hill, right near Oliver's house. And then they burn the remains of the effigy of Mr. Oliver in that fire. They then go to Oliver's house again, and they break into his house looking for him. He's not there. They then start to try and break into the neighbor's houses. They get into a couple of them. He's not there. He's not there. One neighbor conv convinces them that he's actually been removed, that Mr. Oliver has been moved to Fort Hill. I'm uh, sorry, uh, uh, Castle William, uh, to hide along with the governor. Uh, and so that satisfies the group. They disperse. Turns out Oliver was in the next house they were going to search. He was hiding there. So uh, narrow, uh, narrow escape, I suppose. Uh, this riot uh, is the first time uh, that I am aware of uh, in, in this period that the gangs have actually uh, assaulted, uh, assaulted 
pol uh, the property of a politician uh, in such a way. Now, almost immediately after uh, they disperse, they start to disperse. It, uh, Thomas Hutchinson, lieutenant governor of the colony, along with uh, Sheriff Greenleaf, Hutchinson decides to go outside and deal with the mob, which is a terrible idea. Uh, and he's greeted with uh, a leader of the mob who shouts, and the, and the leader is, again, presumably Ebenezer McIntosh, though we don't know for sure. Uh, he is greeted with, the, resp uh, with uh, the leader shouting, the governor and sheriff to arms, my boys, or, uh, according to another account, God damn their bloods, here's the sheriff and the governor. Stand by, my boys, let no man give way. Now, the interesting thing about that quote, I think, is that in both accounts, totally separate accounts, in both accounts, Thomas Hutchinson is referred to as the governor. Thomas Hutchinson is not the governor. Francis Bernard is the governor. Thomas Hutchinson is lieutenant governor and chief justice of the royal court. Just keep that in mind, because Hutchinson's going to become relevant again in another minute or so. They pelt these guys with rocks. The two men run away. Uh, and then they continue their festivities throughout the evening, drinking very heavily, and they disperse about midnight. The next day, there's another bonfire. Nothing major happens. Uh, the newspapers generally don't talk much about what had happened. Uh, and the Boston Gazette, the Whig, uh, the Whig newspaper that's owned by Benjamin Eads, uh, it makes light of, uh, of the protest. Seems to su it seems to suggest that the people are, generally speaking, in support of the, the message, if not necessarily some of the actions. On August 26th, 1765, the gang reconvenes. And the gang reconvenes behind Ebenezer McIntosh. It is at this point that Governor Bernard suggests that, the, that his followers, that McIntosh's followers, uh, if there's even a whisper among them, the rays of McIntosh's finger will silence them all. The suggestion here is that McIntosh has complete control over this gang, uh, that they'll do whatever he wants them to do. And apparently, what he wants them to do is destroy some things. Uh, so they go to the houses, the actual residences, uh, of a few, uh, a few, a few political, low-level political officials. Uh, just sec uh, vice, vice, uh, vice chairman of the Admiralty's house gets destroyed. Uh, another uh, customs official's house gets destroyed. But then they go to the, they go to the top they go to Thomas Hutchinson's house. Now, Thomas Hutchinson, remember, uh, is referred to by the leader, presumably McIntosh, as the governor. He has also been implicated as being somewhat responsible for the Stamp Act, despite the fact that he is absolutely not responsible for the Stamp Act. So, uh, uh, the gang goes to Hutchinson's house, and they try to get Hutchinson out. Uh, and he it appears he's going to do it, but the, he tries to get his family out the back door, and his family won't leave without him, so he leaves with his family. So the gang ransacks the house. They tear it down. They destroy the, they break down the walls. They smash out the windows. They destroy all of his personal effects, all of his clothing, uh, all of his, uh, his, uh, his writing. Uh, he'd been working on a volume of the history of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, which they dispersed in the mud and stomped into the ground. Totally, completely destroyed the property of Thomas Hutchinson. So completely, in fact, that the next day when Hutchinson went to the government to petition aid, he had to do so in his pajamas. He said he didn't have anything else to wear. Uh, so this mob really successfully destroys everything. Um, the problem is that destroying the governor's house, uh, the lieutenant governor's house, uh, goes beyond the realm of what's acceptable in civilized society. Uh, the, the more upstanding gentlemen of Boston seem taken aback by this. Uh, and all of a sudden, the Boston Gazette, who had championed this and possibly been, had a role in planning it, certainly uh, encouraged it. Uh, they're, they're denouncing the violence. They're suggesting that uh, this was totally out of the control of the Whig leadership, that nobody wanted this, despite the fact that it was impossible uh, that they didn't know that at least there'd be some convening on August 26th, because these men all know Ebenezer McIntosh. They'll work with Ebenezer McIntosh. They also don't denounce Ebenezer McIntosh. Ebenezer McIntosh is arrested following the second riot uh, on August 27th. And proclamations are put out by Governor Bernard. And Governor Bernard's proclamation offers 300 pounds uh, for the leader of the Stamp Act riot, and uh, 100 pounds for the leader of the first riot, the August 14th riot, and any other uh, people who were involved in the riot, 100 pounds for them too. And if you were involved in the riot and you give up the leader, not only do you get that 300 pounds, but you are, for, you are forgiven. You, are, you, you, you will not be prosecuted. And nobody gives up Macintosh. Regardless, though, he is arrested. They have him in custody. Uh, and he's in, he's in custody for less than a day. 
Uh, and the reason he is released is because Samuel Adams informed Sheriff Greenleaf that if McIntosh was not released, that the guard would not report for duty because he arranged it that way. Uh, and so immediately it became apparent that McIntosh could not be held, so he and a few of his associates who were arrested for the riot, they were let out. And a standing uh, proclamation from the governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony requested that he be arrested and that if you could, arre if you could get him arrested, you'd get 300 pounds, and nothing happened. He just stayed free. Not only did he stay free, but he stayed involved uh, in, uh, in, le in a leadership role throughout 17, uh, late 1765 and into 1766. In 1765, uh, on November 1st, the Stamp Act was supposed to go into effect. But we have no stamp master. In fact, no colony in America except Georgia has a stamp master in, say, on November 1st, 1765. Uh, while the protests certainly started in Boston, uh, in, in, the, the violent protests, the riots certainly started in Boston, uh, they expanded elsewhere. Newport had very severe riots. There were, pre, there were big protests in other colonies. Uh, there were protests in front of governors and lieutenant governors' houses and the like. So the law doesn't go into, into effect. And another convening of the gangs occurs on November, 5th, on November 1st, and it starts at the Liberty Tree. And at the Liberty Tree, the gangs march, both gangs, North End, South End gangs, march behind Ebenezer McIntosh. And Ma Ebenezer McIntosh suddenly now not only is still the leader of these gangs, totally, uh, totally recognized by the so-called political leadership, the Samuel Adamses and the James Otises of the world, but now he's really well-dressed. This poor shoemaker suddenly has a blue suit with gold trim, a colonial megaphone, and a, uh, and a, and a cane, a rattan cane. So McIntosh is very well dressed, leads the procession, totally nonviolent, totally controlled, because McIntosh has control of it. Remember, if there's a whisper in the crowd, the rising of McIntosh's fi finger will silence them. Four days later, though, is the riot day. It's November 5th. The gang, again, has a procession. Again, it's led by McIntosh. Uh, the, the North End gang and the South End gang march together, and again, there's no violence. There's not even really a threat of violence again until December. And in December, there is a, uh, <clears throat> there is a, 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 a suggestion in the newspapers, again, the Boston Gazette, that perhaps Andrew Oliver has not properly resigned his position. Now, it's true that Hutt, uh, Oliver has, in writing, resigned his position, uh, but it wasn't good enough for everybody. Now, Oliver was uh, not only asked in the newspaper to resign his position, but the authors of the, new, uh, of the newspaper, they also wrote him a formal letter requesting his resignation publicly. And he offered to make a public resignation at the old state house, which was the townhouse at the time, the seat of government. They said no. They said that he had to do it at the Liberty Tree. And I just want to remind you all, the Liberty Tree is the rallying point initially of the South End Gang. It's Macintosh's tree. Uh, he is not thrilled about this, but he agrees to it. And then placards are put up all over town that read, the true-born sons of liberty are desired to meet under Liberty Tree at 7 o'clock this day to hear the public resignation under oath of Andrew Oliver, Esquire, distributor of stamps for the province of Massachusetts Bay. A resignation? Yes. Oliver, at this point, has not been doing his job that he was appointed to for six, uh, for six weeks already, because November 1st is when, uh, when the law was put into action, uh, and it's mid-December. He is made to march publicly to the Liberty Tree and uh, announce his resignation, which everyone knows he's already done, uh, in front of thousands of people. And who is his escort? It's Ebenezer McIntosh. They assign this rioter who they all know is responsible for these riots. They all know. They assign him to march this man to his tree and announce that he is no longer the Stamp Master. And Oliver very thoroughly denounces the Stamp Act at that point and says that he considers himself a, 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 patriot, of, uh, a patriot in America uh, and that he will never enforce the Stamp Act in this colony. And then he goes home. So we get to the end of December, uh, 17, uh, 1765. From then on, things get kind of quiet. In, uh, in, in, seven, in March of 1766, it is officially announced that the Stamp Act has been repealed, though nobody really noticed uh, in Boston because it never went into effect in the first place. 
And in 1766, there's another celebration. But this time, conspicuously missing are the gangs. The gangs aren't there. Macintosh isn't there. It's all gentlemen. All these gentlemen celebrating the repeal of the Stamp Act and the nonviolent protests, which they're very explicit in pointing out, uh, that, got a, that got the act repealed. The newspapers start writing a history, and Boston, uh, again, the Boston Gazette is, leads in this, start writing a history of the Stamp Act, uh, the Stamp Act crisis. And they recount that there was a Stamp Act Congress who petitioned the government, and that there was nonviolent protest uh, in Boston uh, that led to uh, the uh, lack of enforcement. And they denounce the violence. They denounce it as, uh, as essentially the, the work of Satan. Uh, and they say that it was just the, low, the lowest of the low, the low commoners uh, who do not represent us, uh, the people of Boston. And from that point forward, Macintosh just disappears. You never really hear from him again. He lives in Boston uh, for a couple of more years. Uh, he, he claims later in his life uh, that he was at the Boston Tea Party uh, and that his little chickens did the deed. Uh, but there's actually no evidence that he was there. He probably wasn't. He's probably lying. Um, he, he dies in obscurity uh, in Vermont. Uh, he walks to Ohio every couple of years to see his children who had moved out there. Uh, he's never recognized uh, by, by his own associates uh, who he did so much work for. He's considered a villain. He's considered a rioter. Now, this may seem strange, except you've got to remember the Boston Tea Party also though, is not considered a, a great achievement in, in the contemporary times. Uh, people aren't proud of that. It isn't until much later that they celebrate this riot uh, once they have enough distance from it. And of course, they celebrate, uh, there's a statue of him right there, George Robert Twelves Hughes. Uh, he, he is celebrated, really, because he happens to still be alive when people decide uh, that they like the Boston Tea Party. But previously, nobody was celebrated for that. So Macintosh just disappears into obscurity, which is a tragedy. Uh, but an important thing to, uh, to consider when you think about riots in American history. Because the rioters don't always end up the leaders. Oftentimes, they're, they're, oftentimes their movements are unclear, they are unfocused, and more often than not, they are co-opted. Uh, you, see, uh, you see protest movements all over the country over the, over the years. I think, uh, for a contemporary example, uh, both, uh, it's not a riot, but the Tea Party movement on one side and the Occupy movement on the other side, totally co-opted by, by leading figures uh, who take, uh, take the energy and some of the ideas, but maybe not the violence, and they move forward with it. Uh, this was true in the 18th century as well, and Ebenezer McIntosh uh, was, was your great occupier. He was your great Tea Party leader. He was, he was, he was the movement on the ground. Uh, so I thank you all for listening uh, to my, my discussion, uh, to my talk. Uh, I'm happy to take questions now uh, if anyone has any. Uh, this is a very basic question, but when did they begin calling the Boston Tea Party the Boston Tea Party? When did that happen? That's a great question. Um, so it was called the destruction of the tea uh, in, in the period uh, that it happened in. It wasn't called the Boston Tea Party until uh, the, the, uh, the early 19th century. There was actually a book written about it uh, that referred to it as such. I, I don't remember the exact year, but it was the early 19th century. Here. Sure. Yeah, the question was, uh, what was the status of law enforcement in colonial America? Uh, I mentioned a sheriff, but what else was there to enforce law? And generally, the answer is nothing. Uh, Governor Bernard actually articulates this phenomenally in his letters. Uh, he says that uh, the Stamp Act is a terrible idea that, frankly, there's no way that I can enforce. You know, there, there's no mili uh, we don't have a military regiment here. He actually asks at one point on August 27th, I want to say, in a letter uh, to, uh, to Parliament, he asks for them to send soldiers, even though they, he doesn't even have the authorization to do that. He needs it from the council, uh, and he doesn't have it. Uh, the only um, police force, to the extent that we have a police force, because police aren't a thing yet, uh, the only police force we have is we have a sheriff, uh, and we have constables. And constables, there are, I think, 12 or so uh, in Boston in 1765, uh, and they're you know, essentially unarmed. Uh, th that's, that's the entire... Oh, and then there's the militia. We have uh, a militia that can be risen, uh, and the militia is actually called on, uh, on August 14th, and the militia leader says that he can't call the militia because the militia is in the mob. Uh, so, <laughs> great question. You uh, mentioned uh, the Boston Gazette's uh, role in uh, raising the opposition to the Stamp Act. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing that I realize, of course, is the Stamp Act taxed news media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And yeah. so the Gazette's got its own personal interest in opposing that tax. Absolutely. And uh, actually, on November 1st, one of the very few things, uh, one of the very few industries that is affected by the Stamp Act is there are, br there's briefly a period where some newspapers stop publication uh, because they can't get access to paper. However, the Boston Gazette is one of the very few papers that continues throughout the crisis. Uh, but yeah, they absolutely have a vested interest, yeah. Thank you for the lecture. I really enjoyed it. Thank uh, you. Did Ebenezer McIntosh have anything to do with inciting the Boston Massacre? As far as I know, Macintosh wasn't even in Boston uh, in 1770. Uh, he, I, I, I've never seen any evidence that he was there. Uh, certainly, he may, even if he was in town, I've never seen any evidence that he was actually at the massacre. So my inclination is to say there's no evidence of it. Uh, I wouldn't totally dismiss it. Um, I'd certainly love to see any suggestion that he was. Uh, but I, as far as I know, no. Um, to what extent do you think Macintosh was merely the agent of the Loyal Nine or perhaps people even more prominent than they, mm -hmm. uh, or was he really a representative of the people and mm -hmm. is he uh, the leader of a spontaneous ri rising of the people? Yeah. Um, that's an awesome question. It's really my favorite question. Uh, so this is actually something that's been debated in great detail among historians. Uh, the late Pauline Mayer, uh, who used to teach at MIT, uh, she was pretty insistent that he was uh, essentially just an agent of the Loyal Nine uh, and that uh, everything, all the really violent stuff, uh, particularly the second riot, uh, was, a, um, w was a product of him get it, essentially getting off his leash. Uh, other historians uh, have argued that that's not the case, that he is a leader in his own right. I think it's probably somewhere in the middle. Uh, he, the, the, the piece of information that there was a warrant for his arrest that Samuel Adams put down, and then all of a sudden he was leading riots that were in Samuel Adams' interest, that is a little suspect. But uh, shoemakers historically uh, tend to be kind of radical, and the reason there's a couple reasons for that. One of them is that they don't make a lot of money, but the other is that they sit in circles uh, and work together. So Macintosh, who is definitely literate, by the way, he has a signature that suggests that he knows let what letters look like and what they do. Uh, Macintosh seems to be the kind of guy who would be aware of what's going on in his community, uh, and certainly uh, he became a, a leader in his own right in, this, in, this, in the Pope Day riot of 1764. Uh, whether or not his, his, uh, his objectives were as politically focused as James Otis's or Samuel Adams, uh, I would I would guess, and this is pure conjecture, that they weren't, uh, that he didn't have as clear an idea. I think he felt, uh, he felt like he didn't have power in the legal system because he didn't have the right to vote, uh, and he was upset about general things going on in society, and this was a way to focus that anger. Uh, that's what I would say. Thank you. Um, wonderful talk. I enjoyed it very much. My question is, do you have any suggestions as far as further reading materials for those of us who might wish to learn more about Mr. McIntosh? Yes. Uh, everything Alfred Young ever wrote. <laughs> um, Alfred Young particularly wrote a book called The Liberty Tree, which is, uh, which is invaluable. Um, also, Pauline Mayer's Resistance to Revolution uh, is a great book. Um, and there are some modern books that touch on this uh, pretty well as well. Um, What's that book called? Uh, American Tempest by Harlow Unger uh, is very good. Uh, off oh, and uh, As If an Enemy's Country. Uh, I can't remember the author's first name, but it's Archer is their last name. Uh, those are all great resources on the riots. And uh, there's not a whole lot of work on Macintosh specifically, because frankly, not a lot is known about him. Uh, but he, he, he is interwoven uh, into a lot of people's work uh, in a really great way. One other thing I would say about Macintosh and, and learning about him, Macintosh is a lower level figure, right? So we're, we're happy to have a, a lower level figure to talk about. But the reason we talk about Macintosh is because he's the lowest level figure that we know anything about. But there might be an even better story about the guy right behind Macintosh who, says, who stops talking when he puts his finger up, but we just don't even know who that guy is. Uh, so Macintosh is just an effort for us to reach down and learn more about the people instead of just the leaders. <laughs> Uh, the question was, uh, he had heard recently that the American Revolution was a conspiracy, uh, and what are my thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't think it was. I think it was pretty organic. Um, certainly there were some planners, uh, but I don't think they were all working together. Uh, the leaders in Virginia and the leaders in Massachusetts have very different end goals in mind. Great. Thank you, Well, thank you, you so much, everybody. This was really great.